Oh, there we go. So cows run around outside and eat mostly plants. And that's what we should all do for, it's kind of weird, uh, for our bone health, of course, it's not really feasible. But we're starting, I'm going to start with a quiz. And if I could have a show of hands, and you can write a score down. Now, this is not a certified, verified method to tell you whether you eat well. I made it up, and um, it hasn't gone through the rigors of a validated questionnaire. But it's kind of a fun way to look at what you eat, how much you eat. And uh, I gave you pre-lecture, post-lecture, what your plans are post-lecture. And then I gave you four dates over the next year to see if you change your behavior. And um, so let's, uh, and you can write your scores down, but again, it's meaningless. And I went back and forth about the arbitrariness of it, and it's very arbitrary. So don't get upset and say, wow, it's really arbitrary, because I know it. But it just gives you uh, an idea of how to think about behaviors relating to bone health and other mental health as well. But uh, OK, I eat at least five cups of fresh or frozen plants in a day. That's fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. How many of you eat five cups at least of fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds? OK. Um, so give yourself zero for that, except the one person over there. I exercise at least an hour a day, four days a week. So we're talking four hours a week. Well, that's pretty good. That's probably about a third. So, um, so those people who raised your hands, you get one point for that. I sweat from exertion at least three times a week. This isn't so much from your bones. This is, this is really uh, more for your heart and muscle mass, but that's what keeps your bones strong, too. I eat no sweets. OK. Uh, I do not smoke cigarettes or marijuana. OK, that's pretty good. Not too much improvement needed there. I am up and about busy most of the day. Yep. Yep. We're doing pretty good on most of those. I sleep well. OK, well, that's pretty good. Uh, I have not had exposure to heavy metals. Now, most of you are in an age where your homes were painted with lead paint. Um, I played with mercury when I was a child. Uh, what? Pardon? We did too. Yeah, played with mercury. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's fun. Slippery, breaks into little ball. It's anyway. I eat a low salt diet. Oh, about a third, and I drink mostly water. Okay, so give yourself one point for every thing you said yes to and write that down in the pre-lecture above those questions. And after the lecture, as, we, as I talk, I want you to think, hmm, what could I change to get another point? And so that's the post-lecture plan, really. So what is osteoporosis? The word literally means bone poverty. Most people reach their peak bone mass at age 30. Oh, the cows. I never told you about the cows. I'm so sorry. My sister lives on a farm in Belize. Uh, these aren't her cows. Uh, but we went to visit these cows. And I have talked to multiple vets. And I, we, my family had a farm when I was a kid in Iowa. These cows were herding us. There were five of us, and we were with the guy who raised them, and we were walking across this big farm. And I think the cows thought we were going to hurt their owner. And there were a 100 of them. And they 
ran at us and then circled around us and ran off. And we were just going, oh my gosh, we could die. <laughs> um, so herded by cows, one of the most extraordinary, mind-boggling experiences I've ever had. And it's unfortunate that we eat these uh, beautiful, smart beasts. Um, not particularly good for the earth. So, so before the age of 30, it, you're making deposits in your, your bone bank. After the age of 30, you're making withdrawals. It is pretty much downhill. That said, I have had patients who change their behavior and actually improve their bone mass. But for the most part, you don't change your behavior. And it's hard. You're, you're going down. We're, we're all on the downside of that one. But you know, just as an aside, we're all on the downside of, auto, of immunity as well. Your immune system starts pooping out on you when you're between 10 and 15. So we're all beyond that. But over 80% of Michiganders, it, over 80% of 65-year-old and older adults are vaccinated for COVID in Michigan, which is a good idea because our immune systems are pooping out. So bone is constantly turning over, just like your skin, just like your hair. It's parts of it are being destroyed and then it has to be rebuilt and it's just, you can't keep up the rebuilding part as you age. That's why your skin sags, your hair turns gray, your cheeks sag, everything sags. Um, you can't keep up with that. Osteoporosis itself is, uh, is defined by numbers on a bone density test. I'm not going to give my lecture on how stupid I think bone density tests are. Um, they're the standard, I guess I will, they're the standard of care, but a bone, we'll say a vertebra, is like a cube, right? It's a cube. It has a dense shell, dense thick shell, and inside it's got spongy bone that's connected. And when you start losing, losing bone mass, you lose these spongy connections. So this one breaks, you don't feel it. This one breaks, you don't feel it. This one breaks, you don't feel it. And then you, take, you do this test where you take a picture of this block, reduce it to a flat two-dimensional picture, and put the, the outside bone with the inside bone, and you don't talk about the connections. That's what's wrong with it. Do we have the technology to do a reasonable test? Yeah, CAT scan. And it, you, they used to do CAT scans. Uh, the politics I won't go into, uh, but the politics of why you get your bone density test every year is ludicrous. The guys who made the bone density test who I happen to have met, um, they uh, made bone density machines, they lobbied Bill Clinton to say the test should be done every two years, when in fact the data says probably five is a better, uh, a better time frame to repeat that. So, uh, so both men and women get osteoporosis. However, postmenopausal Caucasian and Asian women are much more prone to get it. Uh, African women and uh, Africans and people of African descent tend to have better bone mass than Caucasians. So, um, so the cows. Oh, I haven't been. Uh, so this is uh, up in the upper right is just some. Uh, pictures of bone that's just sliced. So you can see what happens from the left. That's where, the, and these trabeculae are cut. That's why you're seeing the spikes on the outside. This bone is cut in half. So you can see that as you move to the right, that bone is just much more porous. Um, 
the picture on the right is a world famous classical South Indian dancer. She's not quite um, five feet tall. I'm pretty sure she doesn't weigh 100 pounds. Uh, she does something that is extremely percussive. Uh, she sweats her little brains out uh, hours a day. Um, so who knows what her bone mass is going to be. She's, she's got some pros and cons. Uh, she's a vegetarian. Uh, I was uh, s seven, 69 in that picture standing next to her. Uh, Caucasian ballet dancer. Uh, but then I did percussive dance for 40 years and you know, I have some risk. Um, and the lady down on the mat is my uh, co-student along with Margaret, who I forgot to introduce. <laughs> uh, this is Margaret Dionys. Um, Margaret and I are students together in a Pilates class in Old Town. And I just took pictures of the class and Margaret agreed to come here and do some, uh, some of our Pilates uh, workout. Uh, this lady uh, actually can't get up and down from the floor by herself. She only walks with a walker. But look at that plank. She has had fragility fractures of her pelvis, her spine, her arm, her hip. I think that's it. There might be more multiple fragility fractures. I think she's lost five or six inches of height. Um, and I can't do a plank like, like she can. But uh, anyway, Margaret is, um, Margaret's going to demonstrate Pilates. And there are, uh, Nani Barbario teaches Pilates in Old Town. She's a wonderful teacher. Um, and she wanted me to make sure that I tell you, uh, like all exercises, you can get hurt in an exercise class. You can get badly hurt in an exercise class. So you have to be careful who you let tell you what to do with your body. You have to be really careful. I think the best advice I can give you is Tai Chi advice, which is do about 70% of what you think you can do. So 70% is just kind of a good rule. Uh, The health conditions that lead to osteoporosis are many. Celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory anything disease, diabetes, particularly diabetes type 1, chronic diarrhea, liver and kidney disease, cancer of any type, and that's mostly because of the medicines and the other effects it has of you just not moving around much. Uh, and anything that impairs your gait. So stroke, pulmonary disease, multiple sclerosis, bunions. Now you never think about bunions as changing your life much. And I look around the room and I think I probably see a few bunions. Um, and I forgot to put a slide on shoes. Uh, you'll notice that I'm wearing really cute shoes. <laughs> they go with everything, but um, they aren't really platform shoes. I, have a short leg after a hip replacement. So I have a lift in one shoe and a plate on the other one because the other foot broke. <clears throat> so it makes the shoes kind of clunky. But um, um, some of you are wearing extremely dangerous shoes. And uh, high heeled shoes ruin your feet. They shorten your life. They shorten your life by impairing the strength of the whole lower extremity. It gets it reverberates up the chain, so it's bad for everything to wear high-heeled shoes. God knows why women still wear them. I mean, um, but I did ballet, so I wore one of the stupidest shoes on the face of the earth. Uh, what factors are changeable? Make sure your endocrine system is working. Um, 
obesity. Wow, you'd think, wow, obesity. I'm carrying around 50 pounds, 100 pounds too much. That should be good for my bones, right? No, do you know why it's not good for your bones? Because bone, it, it's a really complex uh, mechanism, but bone will particularly move to the thoracic vertebrae between where my thumb and my finger are, and it displaces bone. I mean, the bone just resorbs and gives way to fat, and those are what crush over the time. And the other lady that had the multiple crush fractures, I don't think she ever noticed any of those vertebral fractures. The pelvis one she did, she couldn't walk. And she's six months, eight months past that pelvis, seven months past that pelvis fracture. Seven months, that's pretty quick. Um, alcohol, poisonous to the GI tract, poisonous to the bones, poisonous to the esophagus. Um, smoking, uh, weight loss surgery, uh, and uh, eating disorders. Medications that cause bone loss, sometimes these can't be helped. Uh, Anti-seizure medicines, medications for reflux, cancer meds, transplant rejection meds, and corticosteroids. Um, usually the inhaled ones aren't too bad. It's the oral ones, particularly doses over seven and a half milligrams a day of prednisone for more than 30 days definitely requires uh, bone protection with medication. So what about sex hormones? Well, in general, testosterone is, is pretty good for your bones, and men tend to have better bone mass than women. Women also make testosterone, but in much lower dose, much lower levels than men. Uh, female to male gender change actually improves bone loss for those people who go through hormone therapy. Probably none of you are at the age where you're thinking about that kind of thing. But uh, 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 prostate cancer medications are actually estrogen-like medications. And so for men uh, with prostate cancer, those drugs uh, lower the bone mass. Uh, Female-like hormones are no longer used to treat osteoporosis, and even in amenorrheic, uh, that is women who don't menstruate because they're too thin, um, giving them female hormones doesn't protect their bone mass. You really need estrogen alone just isn't enough. And there's an accelerated loss after menopause And what are the symptoms? Well, maybe none. And, and uh, that student doing the plank was a really good example of it. She, she didn't hurt till I think she broke her arm first, maybe a wrist. Uh, I guess it was a wrist then arm. Uh, a height loss may be the only thing that you notice. And how many of you get measured for height when you go to the doctor? Woohoo. That's oh, pretty good, more than 50%. Um, so, and f uh, a fragility fracture is a fracture with little or no trauma. And this is just uh, ca a cartoon, actually it's a drawing from Frank Netter, uh, who gave a really nice demonstration of what happens over time to the spine, and in the third uh, the third spine over the ilium, the, the ribs are actually hitting the top of the um, iliac crest. That's incredibly painful. These people are miserable. Uh, this patient of mine uh, had rheumatoid arthritis, severe osteoporosis. She lost seven inches in height. Uh, she had multiple fractures, multiple to the pelvis, uh, the wrists. The one that really killed her and I had never seen was the sternum. She coughed and she bent over and she cracked her sternum. I've never seen that. Uh, and she was always cheerful. I shouldn't have looked that cheerful there, but she was. So 
let's move on to prevention, and I better keep moving, huh? Uh, so open chain exercise, I had to throw in a little bit of biomechanics. I never defended my thesis. I published it and moved on to rheumatology, but uh, anyway, uh, so open chain exercises are the things that she is doing. There's, uh, if, if I were to hold her feet down while she was lifting her body up, that would be a closed chain exercise. And if she had, uh, when she does a sit up thing, like a sit up, th roll up, roll down thing, uh, if I hold her feet down, that makes it closed chain. So elliptical machines are closed chain. And a lot of you think, well, closed chain is better. Like I would think, wow, I should do closed chain. I could get my heart rate up and be better because my foot's broken, it's too hard to walk, but it's not. Closed chain, uh, open chain, I'm sorry, closed chain exercise, it's not functional. You don't do much that's closed chain. That's closed chain. That means both ends are fixed, right? So you want to do things that are open chain. One, one side is fixed. Uh, like the cows, running in the fields, climbing trees, skipping, jumping rope, uh, sitting on the floor. Cultures who squat to toilet or who uh, sit on the floor when they gather in uh, churches and places of worship, those cultures tend to have better bone mass. Uh, weightlifting with body weights, free weights, equipment, or weight vests. So for s uh, small people, actually one of my uh, patients, uh, she's a tiny, tiny little white woman, and she got a weight vest, and um, she actually improved her bone density scores with a weight vest. I've had others that have done that. So uh, yoga, uh, yoga is extremely dangerous. I've, uh, you have to be really cautious about your yoga teacher. So these are just some really famous pe uh, people. On the left is uh, Martha Graham. She had horrible rheumatoid arthritis. She performed until she was 76 uh, with her company. Uh, she bowed with her company every night and she died when she was, I think, 90, she was 90 something. She was amazing, but when she was 76, she did this and went to her knees with her arms over her head. And she couldn't get back up, and she crawled off the stage. <laughs> and she said, that's it, I'm done. Uh, it's good to know when you're done. Uh, the women in front of the Capitol uh, in Michigan are the Habibi dancers. They do uh, belly dance. Belly dance, a fabulous open chain, gentle, um, uh, movement style, and it, it's a tribe. It's really kind of an American dance form, and I don't know if the Habibis are still around, but they're wonderful. Uh, the uh, a fellow in the upper right is uh, Kaila Charna Mohapatra. He was uh, considered one of the best actor dancers of the 20th century. He unfortunately choked to death on food when he was with his students. I had the honor of helping him set up a performance and perform in Berkeley years ago. And um, seriously, the guy could make it think he was a 16-year-old girl in love. It was it just the most amazing acting I've ever seen. Uh, the lower right is Diane Newman. She's uh, a local celebrity here. She uh, has trained many, many dancers in the Lansing area. Happen Dance is her company. Uh, this is our Pilates class, and uh, let's see, I think the teacher isn't in there, but you can see uh, Etha in front of her walker, and uh, the, um, so it's all bodies, all genders, all sizes, all abilities. This is a, a beginning class, and it's really hard. <laughs> and what she's doing is, I, it doesn't look that hard. No, oh, she makes it look easy. <laughs> You're doing good. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's pretty hard. Yeah. Um, 
these are the uh, gracious ladies. This is Hula Kahiko. That's another <coughs> style that I've studied and performed. And you can see these women are, many of them have gray hair, and I think there's actually a Caucasian woman in there with blonde hair. Um, so, calcium and vitamin D. If you eat eight or nine cups of plants every day, you're getting plenty of calcium in your diet. There's calcium in almost anything. So for those of you that aren't eating well, buff up your diet. Don't take the calcium supplement. You're more likely to get a kidney stone. Uh, vitamin D3 uh, in Michigan. Now, if you, Michigan, the rays of the sun are at best pretty sloped because we're pretty far north of the equator. And it takes between three and th uh, three and four thousand I use a day to uh, get your level up into the thirty to fifty range. That's where I like to see it. If you do a lot of vitamin D and you get it up into the eighty to a hundred range, and then you take calcium, you're much more likely to get a kidney stone that can uh, make you miserable and shorten your life. Um, don't take vitamin D2, don't take vitamin D2, don't take vitamin D2. Um, take vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 was formulated so it wouldn't look like vitamin D3, which is naturally occurring. You can get it in, uh, from eating fatty fish, although the oceans are pretty polluted, so you'll get a little mercury with your vitamin D. If you're heavy and you've got a good, if you're say 50 pounds overweight, and you uh, and you and your vitamin D level is pretty good, and you lose that weight, vitamin D is fat stored in fat. You lose that weight, you lose 50 pounds of fat, you'll bump your level up. To uh, you'll just reabsorb it. So if you're on a on a weight loss regimen, and your vitamin D's in the 50 range, you probably ought to just quit it for a while. But D3, D3 is what you want to take, and do not take 50,000 IUs of nothing, D2 or D3, because you're more likely to get a kidney stone. How many of you have had kidney stones? They suck. They're really horrible. Um, so what about fortified orange juice and cereal? Well, the oranges in orange juice are at least two years old. Vitamin C is fragile, and it just doesn't survive. The other problem with orange juice is it's, you separate the orange juice from the fiber that allows you to absorb it slowly. So orange juice is actually just diabetogenic with very little nutrient. Uh, fortified cereal uh, is ludicrous, eat plants. Uh, avoid all bought cereals. I tell my patients don't eat anything out of a package, a box, or a can. You gotta do some olive oil, you know. Um, so that's a processed food. So, I mean, it's not 100%, but uh, uh, yeah, even if you squeeze the orange juice, it's not so good. But, but you do get better absorption of um, minerals if you do it with uh, acid. That's what orange juice or what oranges are good for. So uh, this is just some of my cooking. On the left is a beet salad. It's uh, beets, oranges, walnuts, garlic, and feta cheese. Uh, on the right, that's my breakfast. That's a pile of fruit and nuts. I've been doing that since I was 20. So I've been doing that for 50 years. And I pretend it's cereal. And when I was a kid, I used to eat cereal. And I'd put that in a bowl, I'd chop it all up, eat it with a spoon, and it's like eating cereal. Uh, well, if my bone mass is low, why don't I just do more D and more calcium? Because you'll get a kidney stone. And you'll damage your kidneys. So you're not going to do that. Um, oh, this is, uh, this is just a biscuit uh, that's made with herbs from my garden. And uh, sometimes I put cheese, I put Parmesan cheese in them. And then the bowl of soup is a gazpacho uh, from my garden. Uh, so that's, 
not exactly plants, uh, the biscuit, but I load it full of herbs. Uh, we already talked about overweight, is being thinner better. Uh, uh, you really have to not delay mens uh, uh, stop menstruation or delay menstruation, which is a problem with ballet dancers. You guys are pretty much past that age, but you may have grandkids. Um, and just speaking as an ex-professional ballet dancer, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, fortunately, my daughter's kept her daughter out of ballet uh, although she really loved it, but it really uh, is so damaging to young bodies, uh, as is gymnastics, it, it, incredibly damaging things. It, and, you know, we're sort of in Larry Nasser land here, but those kinds of techniques where you teach children to do tricks for other people sets them up for doing tricks for other people. And um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, now we're gonna exercise. So, you may either s stay in your chair or you can stand up. I'm gonna stand up. And maybe you could do these with us, Margaret. Yes, and you can do it re yep. really right. I'm all done here. So oh, okay, yep. super. So uh, stand with your feet apart. I guess I should. Okay. I'm gonna stand over on this side. I'm gonna stand sideways to you. So we're gonna start with arch and curl. And you're going to imagine that you've got eyes in the center of your chest and they're gonna look up towards the ceiling. They don't have to, you don't have to do this, okay? Just a little lift in the chest, you're gonna look up at the ceiling, then bring your head up, round your shoulders, pull up your stomach muscles, keep your pelvis upright, and curl your nose down to your belly button. And now you're gonna roll up, starting from the lower, to the middle, to the shoulders, and to the head. Again, arch up, pull up in your stomach, and lift up, and curl forward and down. Keep the pelvis straight up and down, and curl up, two more, and arch, two, and curl. Two, three, four, and arch. Two, three, four, and curl. Two, three, four, roll up. Two. Okay. Now we're going to do this, by the way, is a conglomeration of a whole bunch of things. We're going to do a little Tai Chi, a little belly dance. Um, and some foot exercises from uh, some wonderful guys in Australia. The next one we're going to do, uh, we'll call it seaweed. You're going to keep your feet apart, arms hanging down at your side, and you're just going to imagine that you're a little piece of seaweed floating in the ocean. And dip down and lift. Dip down and lift. Dip down and lift. And you know, see you're feeling like you're feeling. So you're transferring your weight from one foot to the other. And up. Okay. Now we're going to do bird, oh, hip circles. We'll do hip circles first. I'm going to turn sideways to you. So you're going to imagine that uh, the only good visual I can come up with is kind of disgusting. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, just watch me do it. So you take your pubic bone forward, your iliac wing back, and then you go to the side and to the back and the side. So I'll just do it really gigantic. You're making this big circle front, 
outside, back inside. Do it a 70% of where you think you can go. Okay, so we're going to go front, side, back, side, and front, side, back, and side. Keep your chest still, side, back, and side. And if it hurts, make it way smaller. You can do it really small, back, side, and reverse, front. Now we're going that side, back, and side, and front, side, back, side, and front, side. Now you'll be all ready for your Habibi dance class. Mm -hmm. And then you can do it faster. Uh, without the stops. <laughs> I've never performed it. It would be good. OK. The next uh, one we're going to do is from Tai Chi. And it's uh, bird flying. So you're going to inhale and bring your arms up. And exhale and bring them down, and then laugh. Now the laughing is interesting. That's not part of Tai Chi. I just added it because laughing stimulates your vagus nerve, so it calms your heart rate. It reduces your pain. Uh, so laughing turns out to be really good for you. So this is really going to expand your lungs, contract your lungs. And then when you laugh, you blow air, air out. Blow it, blow, 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 blow it out. So then when you fill it, you can really fill it in. So we're going to do this eight times. Inhale. <laughs> we're going to do it four times. Let's get away. Thank you. 